here in the church. Please join the open hand for coming down on my team. <laughs> Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, with the mountains quaking before you, while you wrought awesome deeds 
we could not hope for, such as they had not heard of from of old. No ear has ever heard, no eye ever seen, any God but you doing such deeds for those who wait for him. Would that you might meet us doing right, that we are mindful of you in our ways. Behold, you are angry, and we are sinful. All of us have become like unclean people. All our good deeds are like polluted rags. We have all withered like leaves, and our guilt carries us away like the wind. There is none who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to cling to you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us up to our guilt. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you the potter. We are all the work of your hands. The word of the Lord. Fellowship 
with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. each with his own work, and orders the gatekeeper to be on the watch. Watch, therefore, you do not know when the Lord of the house is coming, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or in the morning. May he not come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Last night we had the, at the uh, five we had the blessing of the wreath, and so it is blessed. But I thought uh, I would take do that prayer over again. So you hear it. It's a good prayer, especially if you have retained that custom of having an advent wreath in your house. The prayer was, Lord God, your church joyfully awaits the coming of its Savior, who enlightens our hearts and dispels the darkness of ignorance and sin. Pour forth your blessing upon this wreath and upon us. As we light the candles of this wreath, may their light reflect the splendor of Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. It's a wonderful custom if you can do it, uh, having an Advent wreath. Someone said that they're hard to find, Advent candles. I think, um, so what I saw one guy do, is he got the normal white candles, those big ones, like that fit around, you know, like motor candles, and the outside of a, a glass jar, he spray painted uh, purple and pink, so they can, and they just kept those for every year. It's an easy way of doing it. Uh, these readings, especially this day on Sunday, answer, uh, address three questions. One is because it's a new church here. You know, we have started a new church here. It has all the hope of the new year. Um, what is Advent? Uh, just to review, especially if you have someone who hasn't heard that in your family, you can review it for them. Um, the, how do you, then the, from the readings, how do you wait for a long time? If someone's coming and you know they're coming, that's sure. How do you wait for a long time? That's not easy. And generally people drift off and stop waiting. But how are you supposed to wait for a long time? How do you, uh, how do we understand waiting? And then, how do you keep Christmas spiritual in a very secular society? A society which is basically, we're getting right on the edge of being what, uh, if an atheist mind came up with a solid society, that's what we would have currently going on. And so what's going on here? Today is a new church year. And just like the New Year's, and you'll see this in the news, it's not in the news right now, but in about a month, you're going to have people talking about a new life and a new chance and rebooting your life, a new opportunity to start. Well, that's what we do spiritually now. The spiritual year begins today, and then it'll go until the first Sunday of Advent the next year. So if 2020 was spiritually tough on you, I think it was on all of us, wasn't it? Okay. The shutdown was like our left hook. Okay. It was really a tough one. 
So um, if 2020 was tough spiritually, reboot. Do it again. Come up with New Year's resolutions for your spiritual life and uh, get started again. Don't start with a big, huge wedding banquet style of practices. Rather, start with a few that are small and easy to do and work on faithfulness first. The areas are prayer. So you have prayer like this at Mass. How can you advance in Mass? Maybe keep a Mass journal. You know, Mass journal is a good practice. You can look that up. It asks questions that you ask in every Mass. What was your favorite song? Did you get anything out of the reading? What one spoke to you? Um, what, did, what did he try to say in the homily? You know, different things like that. Uh, what's your challenge for this week? You should always walk out of Mass with a challenge. How do you think different? So, and then your personal prayer. Are you working on your personal prayer? At least, at least read the daily email. God sends the world a daily email. You got to check it to see if there's something in there for you. It's called the daily readings, especially the gospel. The daily gospel that the Catholic Church sends to the world is an email from God. Check it. It might have something for you today. It may not. Maybe for some someone on the other side of the globe. But. Uh, you got to check it every day. If you do that, and you give God the opportunity to speak to you through the daily gospel, the daily email, and you're going to have a thriving prayer life very shortly. Study. Studying a book. Studying articles. I recommend going to Catholic Exchange, not the Stock Exchange, CatholicExchange.com. And punch in a topic that interests you, and there's a ton of articles, and I like everything they've got. Catholic Exchange to advance in study of our faith. Service is works of mercy. That's the stuff of charity. So um, are you doing service? Is that still happening? One thing I recommend is you have the, uh, it's not, a, we call it a giving tree. You call it a doctor family. As you go right outside, there's about 15 tickets left to buy gift cards. Okay, So I recommend it. That's a wonderful practice. For Advent, if you can do it a few times um, during this um, Advent, that's a wonderful practice. Uh, that's a great service. Then lastly, relationships. I recommend that you work on a thing called Friendship Fridays. It's big in this diocese, where from now until next Thursday, you write down the people you should be contacting. Friends, old family, every one of us has the call that you're putting off too long. Make the call and get geared up to make them all this coming Friday. Friendship Fridays. Prayer, study, service, and relationships. That's the stuff of a New Year's resolution. Come up with something and be faithful to it. Start small and be faithful. Because Advent also is a time to have customs. Customs and traditions of our faith. Not just our prayer life, but things we do as a family. And so I recommend them. If you can do them, some for Advent, it's fantastic. Advent is less penitential than Lent. In Lent, we go in a battle against the seven deadly sins. That's what we're doing in Lent. Advent is more reflective. It's more spiritual. It's trying to get the world view of spiritual life. And so I recommend a couple of things. One is movies. Get out the popcorn, okay? If you can see the movie, I just heard this. I want to look at the movie and check it out again. A good friend of mine said the movie, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. You know, it's kind of a sadish, but it's got a happy ending. It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart is based on the life of St. Joseph, foster father of Jesus. And he goes, it clearly is. Every hope got set aside because of an angel. I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. Over and over and over again. To be generous, St. Joseph had to set aside his, his plans. Well, that's what happened in that movie. So look at it under that. I'm going to. But I know families who every Advent, whether they feel like it or not, they watch A Wonderful Life. They watch A Christmas Carol. There's so many varieties of A Christmas Carol. But that is, that's a meditation on the four last things. That's really what that is. It's very Catholic. Uh, my favorite is the one with George C. Scott. Okay, so I watch it and I just think of old George and Patton acting as an actor in um, *The Christmas Carol*. George C. Scott was also uh, General Patton. 
the um, which is another one you can watch. But the um, there's another one as far as a Christmas carol. It's called The Man Who Invented Christmas. Um, in Britain in the 1800s, 17 and 1800s, religion was dead. Really, because the crown took it over, bureaucracy got involved, and Charles Dickens got a sense of he wanted to jumpstart it, and he did it with the book A Christmas Carol. And so there's a movie, The Man Who Invented Christmas, invented it in Old Britain. Okay. And it's a delightful movie. It'll make you want to see it twice. Okay. So the man who invented Christmas is a great one. There is another one, and this is a serious one, and it's a fact of history. It's called Joy Noel. Now the first word is Joyo. It's French, but if you Google it, J O Y space Noel, it'll jump right to the movie. I've already done it. Okay. Joy Noel, and it's about the Christmas peace. Movement, okay. That moment in 1914, when French, German, and I think it was British troops set us on the Western Front, World War One, set aside killing in order to honor Christmas. It was an historical fact that drove them crazy. Okay, drove their uh, leadership crazy. So, Joy Noel, probably worth seeing. As I said, a Christmas story. We always watch the Christmas tale of that has Bruce Willis, his Christmas tale. The guys I live with, we always watch the Bruce Willis Christmas movie. Um, but um, so use movies, use movies. See it every every advent. Watch a Christmas Carol, a Wonderful Life, uh, a Christmas Story. That's the one of Cleveland BB Gun Kid, a Christmas Story. Um, and use use that to advance your faith and have a blast. Get the popcorn, invite the family in, have a blast. Is it okay to go to Christmas parties? Of course it is. It is. But realize the more you start celebrating Christmas now, you're going to water down the effect of Advent. That's the only thing. Is it a sin? No, it's not a sin. Have a party. But it waters down Advent if you begin celebrating Christmas early. You will go around your neighborhood and you'll see Christmas trees on the, the, the street ready to be thrown out on the, December 26th. That's really not the Catholic way. For us, you can start celebrating early. Yeah, business is doing all the time. You got to go with that to be a, a friendly member. But Christmas, the first day of Christmas, really starts probably the afternoon of the 24th, maybe that evening, depending on your family. Definitely the first day of Christmas is December 25th. So we're in Advent season. Christmas season starts December 25th, and it goes for 12 days. And I don't care if you want to do it or not, you got to have dessert every one of those 12 days. You can't leave the dinner table until you have at least a cookie, okay? Because it's Christmas. Our salvation is come. you got to celebrate it. So mom used to say that. Mom used to say to all of us, you can't leave the table until you finish your dessert. And by the 10th and 11th day of Christmas season, we go, how weird is this? That she has to force us to finish our dessert, okay? There's a lesson being taught there. But 12 days of celebration because our salvation is come. Uh, December 25th is day one. So celebrate Advent. You, the whole thing of making Christmas cards, Advent wreaths, um, having the manger scene and fill it in. We did the straws. Every act of kindness and maturity, we got a straw. And we, see how, we saw how thick we could make that bed for the baby Jesus. Doing a Jesse tree is fantastic. It's the scriptural part. I heard of people doing family gifts. Or from one family to another, they give a whole gift and everybody pitches in, whether on the gift or they make it or making it, the packaging, the whole family does their part. As far as the readings, so that is what is Advent. Um, how do you wait for a long time? In all the readings, it talks about waiting. The master is gone. He's put people in charge and we all have our role to do until he comes again. How are we supposed to wait when it seems like he's really long in coming? For me, I've come to see there's two kinds of waiting, and I got this from my family. The, uh, my great aunt and uncle, Aunt Mabel and Uncle George, um, my, the aunt and uncle of my mom, uh, would um, say that they're going to come over. They drove separately. Aunt Mabel drove a 1966 LeSabre. It's about half the size of this church. Okay? It was huge. It was giant. And I got it. She bequeathed it to me, this, this 1966 Little Sabre, a giant battleship. 
when I got it, she had it, and she gave it to me about 87, 1988. So it's a 22 years of her driving. It had it didn't have 40,000 miles on it. Okay. All that time she took it to church and, and that was it. So that was the first amazing thing. It was almost it wasn't even broken in. The second was on her speedometer, she had a little, little, it's an early version of cruise control. It was a little, I wonder if any of you ever heard this. It was a bead with a dial, and you can dial that bead in, and when your, your speed touched that, it started an obnoxious buzz. <laughs> so if you didn't want to go 70 miles an hour, that's when the cops are going to get you. You would put that at 70, and when you got close to 70, it would start going, burr, 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 and then 70 would go, it was, it's a great cruise control. We should still have it. Hers was set to 40. <laughs> and we had to put glue on it, I mean that glue oil, because it was stuck. Oh. She didn't change it. So okay. she was driving, for all those years, she was driving on I-70, on the Howe Turnpike up in Cleveland, on 71. She was driving at 40 miles an hour when she got on the highway, I-90 up there. She was going 40 <laughs> miles an hour all, the time, all those years. She was the lady in the left lane who was going 40 and stayed in that lane until she got home. Okay? But saintly, George and Mabel, real saints. Um, but they approached coming over our house differently. This is, how, this is the lesson I'm waiting for. And Mabel would say, I'm going to be there at 6 o'clock. I'll be there six sets, um, Saturday at night and we'll have dinner. Which means the bell would ring on the door at 6, not 5.59. It was at 6. It wouldn't be 6.05. At 6, she was there. Punctuality incarnate. And so what happened in our house, we didn't wait around Thursday and Friday. When's she going to come? We do. Okay? She's going to come exactly when she said. That's when she'll be there. And so around 5 o'clock, 5.15, Mom became General Patton. And she started giving the orders. You do this. You do this. You do this. Vacuum over here. Dust over there. Get the plastic off the couch. We had plastic saran wrap over all of our furniture. Because family members weren't allowed to touch it. Only guests were. Okay. So get the plastic off the couch. Make the house look normal and clean. And we did it. An uh, intense whirlwind of activity right before she came. Okay. That's one way of waiting. Intense moments of a lot of activity right before the main event. The other way of waiting was Uncle George. George, a uh, champ of a guy, he was a tool maker, made car parts, and made his own tools. He made them out of ironwood. And then we'd make casts out of those, they didn't know what this is about, and those would be poured and make early car parts. He was good friends with a guy named Henry Ford. And Someone view it, Harvey view it, I think. But um, the, um, George would say, hey, I'm going to be there for dinner on Saturday. Now, he may show up on Friday and stay through Saturday. So he had to be ready. He may show up for lunch on Sunday, because Sunday lunch is closer to Saturday dinner than Wednesday. So he just was kind of a ballpark figure. And Mabel, precise. George was more general. Okay, He may show up at noon, and he'll stay until that evening or the next day. So you had to be generally ready for Uncle George. How did we do it? We always kept his favorite chair in good condition. We weren't allowed to play on it. We got the newspapers off it. Uh, and then he liked to smoke. He would find cigars, and usually we think in trash dumps. And that's what he liked to smoke, okay? The stronger the flavor, like Limburger cheese type cigars, okay? That, we think he aged his cigars in a dirty sock bin. And so we would always keep two or three cigars, so we had some good ones when they came to our house. Because he liked to smoke them inside. We would never stop it. But he liked to smoke them inside, and the next morning we'd go, oh, Uncle George came, because we smelled his cigar cologne. Well, Uncle George, readiness all the time. Those are the two ways we wait for Jesus. There's a general readiness, Uncle George type readiness that we have to have. That's your daily prayer. That's getting to sacraments like you're doing this morning. That's in general trying to live the Christian life, working at your prayer, study, service, relationships. 
That's Uncle George writing this. That's long-term waiting. Not sure when the day is going to happen. Okay? That's what we think the hard part is. And then the church gives us two seasons of intense whirlwind activity called Advent and Lent. Advent is where you pick something up and you start to do something because it's Advent. It's going to end real soon. So give yourself to Advent. It's only a few weeks. And you don't need to practice anything on Sunday if you don't want to. The uh, Lent is much more intense regarding sin. But it's, again, it has an end to it. It's like a navel. Precision, time, get at it. Whirlwind activity. That's what we do. So work on your long-term readiness. That's a project we all have to keep after. But then during Advent, do something. Watch those movies. Come up with some more. Uh, email me. I would say, Pat, if you want to know those movies and my recommendations, I'll email you back. Send it to St. Pat's and they'll work it to me. Um, but that's, that's kind of that long-term readiness. It's worth doing. How about, how do you deal, the next question, beyond what is Advent, how do you wait long-term? You have to do long-term, immediate burst of activity during the Christmas and Lent season. But how do you deal with the secular culture we have? The secular culture is based on, frankly, making a buck, okay? Or an agenda, that's the new thing. Make a buck or make an agenda. And so it's not going to honor Christmas the way that's going to help us spiritually. Just realize that. But we're all in it, so you got to deal with it. So how do you do it? First, you have to know the signs when you might be dealing with the effects of secularism. Okay, my uh, a good friend of mine um, in the order. He's an older father, and he grew up in Mid East, uh, Lebanon. He was there most of his childhood was in Beirut. Uh, if you're aware of it, Beirut in the 70s and 80s, and so. Um, not a happy time. And so uh, we never ask him. We never want to uh, go into that. But when he comes and visits us, he'll watch, how many are familiar with this? Hallmark Christmas movies. You know that? Okay. We get him a special membership to watch Hallmark Christmas movies. And you're never going to hear, and why? Because whatever he has seen in life, he wants to counteract with happiness. It's always happy. There's a Boy and girl, boy meets girl, there's a problem, and do either the, an act of miracles or an act of coincidence, something. They go, the problem is solved, the store is back on track, and guy gets together with girl, and they're a happy couple. That's kind of the storyline of every one of them. He can watch five a day, he can binge on all our cards. Um, and so we asked him why, he said, it's a happy ending. But you'll never hear the name of Jesus, you'll never hear a religious truth about it. You'll never hear a call to to worship or call to get your moral life in order, unless you're a, a greedy bum, like kind of a screwed story. Um, that's it. Okay? That's Christmas without Christ. Uh, the Knights of Columbus thing, keep Christ in Christmas. The Hallmark, they're not, are they evil? No, but just realize when you're going there, you're getting a lot of feelings and kindness in our society to use a dose of kindness. But you're not getting the height of Catholic spirituality for Advent and Christmas. Okay? Just realize that. When you see elves and reindeer, I love them. You know, the island of misfit toys. I, I live there, okay? I know the good guys. The, um, uh, watching the elves and reindeer and stuff, that's great. But it's, it's an introduction into Christianity by Charles, uh, by Charles Dickens. He's the one that introduced all that stuff. Um, that's only 19th century, so it doesn't go back that far in history. Um, it's niceness. It's very moral to be have some of the moral virtues of generosity and goodwill towards others. You're going to hear happy holidays. Don't correct people when they do that. Of course not. You know, we're always gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen to others. But realize ours is Christmas. It's Christmas. We want people, if they celebrate the holiday, they have a great time. But we love the words Merry Christmas. When you can use it, use it. Uh, so how, that's some of the things that's secular. It's feelings only. There's no reference to Christ. There's no reference to the incarnation, the manger, um, no call to worship. The spirit of Christmas, for us, it is the Holy Spirit. Right? The spirit of Christmas is the Holy Spirit, by whose power the Savior is incarnate of a blessed virgin. So how do you get beyond the secular? If you see that, and it's everywhere, hopefully you do see the difference, how do you get beyond it? 
especially when you have to go out into the world to provide food, et cetera, to a family. How do you get beyond that? A couple of recommendations. Know the faces and the names of the people you're going out for. You're just not doing it. Some people like window shopping. It drives me nuts, okay? Because I just think, ah, can't have that. I want it, but I don't need it. You know, I go through East End and do that all the time. Oh, I'd love to have that, but I don't need it. You know, the want versus need thing, you know? Um, know who you're out there for. Know their names. Be, make it an act of love for them, even though it may not have been up till today. Know who you're doing it. It's always an act of love to go from our families and homes out into the world. Make it an act of love. Endure it. One. Two, and this is big, look for cultural artifacts. Be Advent archaeologists. I always wanted to be an archaeologist, probably up until like a month ago, maybe. I've always thought, ah, I'm gonna be an I'm gonna be a priest archaeologist. Okay? Be, um, be an archaeologist. What do they do? Archaeologists dig. When other people look and don't see a thing, then an archaeologist knows their stuff, and they dig and they find shards of bone or pottery or a stone that's been worked, not just natural. And they realize that's from another culture that's no longer there. And so here's an example of a cult of a, a cultural artifact. I was in Walmart and they were putting up the decorations. They do, they do that to make it pleasing to your eye. Okay. I was in Walmart and they were putting up decorations. You know the color that they were putting up? It was purple and pink. Where do you think you find purple and pink? It's not in football. There's no purple and pink teams out there. Here, they're putting up purple and pink. They had no idea why. Someone said, hey, this year, why don't we try purple and pink? You know, I'd like to talk to whoever made that decision. And they got it from the advent wreath that the Catholic Church has had about, I mean, about 500 years or so, maybe more. Uh, the Eastern Church had something much older than ours. We get a lot of our stuff from the Eastern Church, Orthodox. Um, they started a lot of this stuff before we did. That's where they had it. That's an artifact. They have no idea what it is. It's like the barber pole. What's the red stripe on a barber pole? It's not the American flag. It may be not. But it used to be because the barber was also the surgeon. He was really good with a knife. And he could do the surgery on you or he could cut your hair with it. That's what that red stripe is on a barber pole. It may, it may have changed, but that was some of the original stuff. So what's some of the cultural artifacts you should be looking for when you do leave your home? Here's one, evergreen. Now, people say, ah, using evergreen. It's using evergreen for different things is found in every single civilization where evergreen grows, because they're beautiful, okay? But it was, I told people the evergreen is a symbol of eternal life. And someone said, oh no, it comes from the Vikings. I said, no, it doesn't. The Vikings got wiped out, what, like two, three hundred years ago? There's no Vikings around. There's no Viking church, the Church of Vikings, that says, use this because it means this. No, no, that was brought forward because of the Catholic Church. Because saints said it reminds us of eternal life. And so in our culture, Advent culture, we've kept the evergreens. We've kept it alive in culture. There's no Vikings in the 20th century that taught me that when I was a kid. It came from the church, as in the 17th century as in the 10th century. So that's where evergreen came from. It reminds us of eternal life. But if you see evergreen, and it's all over the place right now, people have no idea. It's not like they go, wow, it's late, it's getting towards late December. Let's go kill evergreen trees and cut off their arms. No, they're not doing that. They're doing it because it's kind of what you do around Christmas. They have no idea why. It's an artifact of Catholic culture brought through the years of practice. It was prohibited under John Calvin, okay? Much of England, much of Europe, it was prohibited. But we said, yeah, do it. Then making it look bobbly, putting lights and bobbles on it, they did that long ago, okay? And I just read one article saying it started in the 19th century. No, it was published in the 19th century, but it really goes back. Eternal life with glory, looking glorified, that's the promise of Jesus. Eternal life, looking glorified. And then when you see a tree that's decked out in all its glory, I love that. The more stuff you can put on a tree, the better. It reminds us of the eternal weight of glory that Jesus won for us. You just got to want it and you'll have it. You'll look better than the, the most glorious Christmas tree. 
that's why we continue this stuff, because it's symbolic of multiple things. So what else is out there besides trees, lights being really ornamented? Red ribbons, red and green. There's parts of the world that do red and green. What's going on there? That ribbon reminds us of the ribbons of blood by which he purchased eternal life. So remember that. What's that? I don't know what the plant is. Holiday that has sprinkles of red because of the berries. It reminds us of the price Jesus paid. It's not just because we all start liking holly for some genetic reason in late December. No. It reminds us of the price paid for Jesus and what he was willing to do for us. Paying with his blood. Here's another one. What's the deal with putting socks by the fire? This is a cultural thing. How weird is this? Okay. And then putting gifts in those socks. Hey, you know what? Could you imagine, guys? Why don't we put socks by the fire with shoes? And why don't we stuff them with gifts on December 6th? No, it never happened like that. The reason we have that, the reason that's been retained in the Catholic Church, is because of what happened by a guy who was dead by the year 380. It was a bishop in Turkey. We now call it Turkey. And he heard of a family that was undergoing tough times, and he wanted to help them out. And so he took three, we're not sure if it's bags of gold or three gold balls, and he's the patron saint of a hook shop. Okay? Whenever you see someone about to make a hook shop, ask, dear Saint Nick, help this person. Because he did a hook shop up into the house, and those gold gifts landed in or on the shoes and the stockings and the fire. Okay? It was Saint Nicholas. Helping a family get away from serious debt and the ramifications. So whenever you see that stuff, that's an artifact. Whenever you see a cane, does anyone here have a cane? When you look at a cane, it's like this, right? Or maybe a little bit like that. It looks like an umbrella. What you see in a candy cane is not a cane. That's a crozier. Bishops carry crozier's, like old Saint Nick. Saint Nicholas, the Bishop of Smyrna. Okay. There is a story beyond his, his, his crozier that looks like now a candy cane. It's a candy crozier because the bishop had it. Cultural artifact. Um, the three balls. It's funny, you see those at pawn shops. When you go by the Levy's pawn shop or some of the others, you're going to see three balls because by, you can redeem something by, making, by giving money. It's that whole thing of redeeming something out of a pawn shop. Stockings and shoes being hung up with care. There's another thing. St. Nicholas was probably at the Council of Nicaea. Okay? And um, Nicaea gave us the creed. We're about to say in just a few minutes. I hear our younger brother and sister, and they're saying in baby language, pick it up, Padre. So I'm, I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. Thank you. Thank you. We, though they serve us so well by doing that. And it's not fair to pinch them to get them going early. That's not fair. The... Um, but he was at Nicaea, and Arius, someone said, Jesus is God, and a guy named Arius said, no, he's not. And St. Nicholas says legend. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. St. Nicholas either went, boom, or slapped him, saying, stop it. And the rest of the bishops got together and kicked St. Nicholas out, because we're not a violent people like that. That night, Mary came, in the legend, Mary came to St. Nicholas, and gave him a new chasuble, this thing, that was red. And around it was the bishop's pallium. The trim was pallium, which is white wool. So when you see red and white, which are not cultural colors of Northern Europe, it doesn't come from the old elf. Okay, those colors come from a bishop in Turkey. Okay, that's a cultural artifact. People use it, they put it out there, they have no idea why, but they're always using the same colors. Okay, that's a cultural artifact. Going back to a bishop, probably, I like to think he bopped him, but that's my nature. Um, red and white, red with white trim, points to a bishop. Candy cane, reminds us of the crozier, okay? Gold balls, gifts of gold, silver and gold, isn't just from Yukon Cornelius, it is also talking about a bishop who did a hook shop with gold to help some family. Stockings and shoes. There's a lot more. All of a sudden, this kind of light, stars appear everywhere. What's the deal with that? Star of Bethlehem. That's a Christian symbol. Uh, kings and royalty. Angel choirs. This time of year, this is fascinating. Pastor Green, good friend of mine, Green, uh, Green County Baptist Church. 
Pastor Green um, puts out statues in front of his church. A Mary, Jesus, a baby, shepherds, kings, all these angels. He puts all these angels. Well, for the rest of the year, statues are called idols by him and his church. You know, it's like Green. What are you doing with the statues? How come you get a pass by putting out statues? Give me those statues back. And I, so I asked him, I, I asked him about two weeks ago, I said, Green, are you going to put out the idols again? You're going to put out those idols in your front lawn? And he doesn't even argue anymore. He knows where I'm going. He said, Blah, well, stop it. Stop it. Because those statues are idols for some people, except for Christmas, then you can have them. How weird is that? Okay? We like them all year long. We like them all year long. Angel choirs. This, then the new one is charity. I heard this in a commercial. Show goodwill towards others. If there is no God and it's survival of the fittest, then why do I care if I'm showing goodwill to God others? That's a cultural artifact. Goodwill, peace on earth. Pray for peace, the month of peace. That's all cultural artifacts that have come from Christianity, specifically Catholicism, and we've brought it into the modern world. Lastly, gift giving. That whole gift-giving thing is a cultural artifact. It comes because God gave us the great gift, his son to redeem us. And so because he gave a gift, we can be generous and give smaller gifts. That's why we do that thing. It's not because, wow, it's late December, it's getting cold, let's give gifts. That's a cultural artifact. It comes from Christianity, though it will never be attributed to that in the secular world. That's how you become an Advent archaeologist. When you go out, and I do, I do recommend Franklin Park. I think you have a park here that's dolled up for Christmas. That's wonderful. Franklin Park up in Broad Street, Columbus. It's gorgeous at night. You can see it's, it's got all the, the cultural, U.S. culture, and other symbols and things like that. It's worth seeing. It's just gorgeous. But realize what we're seeing is the influence of our church on a culture, but they've lost the references. They've lost, they don't know where to attribute in a footnote, if you put it that way. Advent is a great time. It's a wonderful time of grace. It's a new start. I would recommend from all of us, if you got a little bit spiritually beaten up in 2020, start anew, start again. Pick up something small and easy to do and be doggedly faithful to it. And you'll see a different spiritual life in 2020. And enjoy this wonderful season of Advent. Perfect time. <laughs> we stand and with one voice throughout the world stretching back through the centuries, we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the Holy Spirit, was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under conscious Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead in the light of the world of God. Amen. We bring to God the longing of our hearts and our desires for the well being of all of God's family.
for the Church of Jesus Christ throughout the world for abundant graces in this holy season. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the civic leaders and public servants, for a heartfelt commitment to the common good, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those rebuilding after natural disasters, for generosity in those who remain unharmed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the lonely, the lost, the poor, and the sick, for hope, help, and healing, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For all who gather at this table, for all who await the Lord's coming into their lives, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For the special intention of this holy mass. Parish family, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. And we all know someone who needs prayer, and you may be the only person that knows it. You're the one that God has let this thing be known to so that you can pray, so we can get you to being part of the team to bring about something good. So who do you think needs prayer? In the silence of our hearts, let's lift up that intention. For all these, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, Father of heaven and earth, you hold the centuries in your hand. Free us from the darkness of sin and lead us into the light of your presence. We ask this through our Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 salvation, that when he comes again in glory and majesty, 
and all is at last made manifest. We who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up in a similar way when the supper was ended he took the chalice and once more giving thanks he gave it to his disciples saying Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Robert, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, 
O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. receive at this moment, and for our viewers, an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, 
and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you.
hermanos, friends. May these mysteries, O Lord, in which we have participated, profit us, we pray. For even now, as we walk amid passing things, you teach us by them to love the things of heaven and hold fast to what endures. Through Christ our Lord. Uh, one friendly announcement, it's the Adopt-A-Family tree. It's right outside the door. I think there's about 16 tickets left on that tree right now. Like many other activities this year, there's a change in gifting to Adopt-A-Family to meet the COVID requirements. Uh, we ask that gift cards only are requested and can be purchased from Kroger, Giant Eagle, Walmart, Myers, or Target. Please place gift card donations in the collection basket. Donations are due by Sunday, December 6th. It's a great way to practice generosity and get back on our game with generosity after a time. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorify the Lord by your life. Amen. Please join the closing hand. Come to the long expected peace. Thank you.